Well, Bertrand Russell was a 19th century philosopher, generally recognized as being one of the founders of analytical philosophy. He was extremely influential on Western thought and also known for his extreme views on religion, particularly Christianity, which he thought to be little more than superstition and generally harmful to people. He was famously asked what he would do if when he died, God turned out to exist after all, and he came before him, what would he say? To which Russell replied, not enough evidence. Not enough evidence. Contrast that with the philosophy of Blaise Pascal, the brilliant mathematician and uh, Catholic theologian who is probably most famous for what is known as Pascal's wager. You may have heard of this philosophical principle. It's simply this. If we live as though God exists, and it turns out that he does exist, we gain heaven. If we live as though God exists and he turns out not to exist, we lose nothing. But if we live as though God did not exist, and it turns out that he does exist, we've lost eternity and gained condemnation. So if you're making a bet, the smart money is on believing in God. The problem is, you're still making a wager, and that's not the safest place to be. For Russell, it was not enough evidence. So faith becomes a leap in the dark, and he ends up in atheism. For Pascal, you need to make the smartest bet, which makes faith a leap without looking, and he ends up in theism, thankfully for him. But look at what Thomas Aquinas said about faith. I think he got this from the Bible. We're going to see that in just a minute. Aquinas said, faith has to do with things that are not seen, and hope with things that are not at hand. To one who has faith, no explanation is necessary. To one without faith, no explanation is possible. See, Blaise Pascal assumed that because he had faith, he had it apart from reason. He didn't think reason was enough to be able to arrive at belief in God. Russell assumed that because he had no faith, that there could not be any justification for it. He didn't think that that was possible. I want to suggest to you this morning that faith itself is a testimony to the reality of God and the certainty of his promises. And the evidence of faith is an encouragement to the believer and an apologetic to the world. This series is called The Mustard Seed Life, and we've been exploring different angles, different views on the reality of faith in the Christian life. Lesson one a couple of weeks ago was that faith is more than a belief, but a lifestyle of total dependence on God. More than just a New Testament concept, it is a thread that extends throughout the whole of Scripture, Scripture, excuse me, from Old Covenant to New Covenant. That is the habit, the lifestyle of faith. Lesson two was that faith as a lifestyle is a challenge, and there's a cost to discipleship. The demands of faith in Christ can only be met by exercising faith in him, and that was the challenge of faith. Lesson three this morning is that faith itself is a testimony to the reality of God and the certainty of his promises, that the evidence of faith is an encouragement to the believer and an apologetic to the world. This, I believe, is one of the key messages of that great faith chapter in the Bible, Hebrews chapter 11. So will you turn with me there this morning? Hebrews chapter 11. I want to read for you beginning at verse 1, and we'll go all the way down to verse 7. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. This is God's word. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, 
God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended at having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Verse 7, by faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for saving of his household. By this he condemned the world, and he became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Hebrews 11 is an encouragement to persevere in the face of trial. Remember last week, Jesus said, trial is sure to come. Temptation is sure to come in the life of the disciple. This is an encouragement written as a series of examples to follow and emulate which will lead to encouragement in the life of the believer. The context of Hebrews 11, of course, is Hebrews 10, immediately preceding, where the writer has just finished a long exposition of the glory of Christ and the meaning of Christ's sacrifice once and for all. He then moves into an encouragement, a call for perseverance, which culminates in chapter 10, verses 35 to 39, just before the passage we read. Let me read a bit of it for you. Verse 35 says, Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. You can see that he is foreshadowing the ideas he's going to continue in chapter 11. For yet a little while, verse 37, and the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. From here, we launch into the faith chapter. What is this chapter doing? What is he accomplishing in chapter 11 by citing all these examples by faith? It's important to understand that verse 1 can be read subjectively or objectively. What do I mean by that? If we read subjectively, we'll read it as a definition of faith and talking about the inner experience of faith, what happens in our mind when we believe. If we read it objectively, we'll read it as a description of faith talking about the outward expression of the inner belief. I think it makes more sense to read it objectively in light of the series of examples of outward faith that are demonstrated by the people of old. That's how I want to read it this morning with you. Let's look at a little bit of the translation of verse 1 to understand where I'm going. The ESV that I read to you says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The King James renders that faith is the substance of things hoped for. That's a little more concrete. The New Living Translation says, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. That's a clear outward expression, isn't it? Look at the second part of verse 1. The conviction, that's a belief, the conviction of things not seen. King James says, the evidence of things not seen. That's external. New Living says, faith is the evidence of things we cannot see. See, you see what I mean by those words in the Greek can be taken subjectively or objectively. Commentators have interpreted this in different ways. But even if you read it objectively with the outward expression of faith, the actions produced by faith still flow out of the subjective. So it doesn't discount the conviction and assurance we have by faith. But his point here is to encourage by looking at what faith has done in the life of the historical characters of the characters of the biblical narrative. Faith in the unseen is meant to encourage us. Just like Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed. For this light momentary affliction, trials to come, 
is preparing us for an eternal way of glory. The promises beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, says Paul. And here we take it to the next level by showing a whole slew of examples of faith in the unseen, bringing to fruition in the actual living of life through the biblical narrative. I call this the evidence of faith. And that's why I want to explore this idea with you this morning, that faith itself is a testimony to the reality of God and the certainty of his promises. The evidence of faith being an encouragement to us, but also an apologetic to the world. So with that in mind, let's wade through, let's trace four evidences of faith from our text, verses 1 to 7. We want to ask ourselves the question while we do that. As people of faith, reading about people of faith, as followers of the way, as disciples of Jesus, are we displaying these evidences of faith in our own spiritual journey, in our own daily walk? And how do we get them? I'm giving away my application because I want you to look for it along the way as we move through each successive illustration. And the first is this, that faith evidences evidences itself in understanding. Faith evidences itself in understanding. This is in verse 3. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. The preceding verse, verse 2, serves to introduce the fact that the author is going to give a list of examples. But it's kind of interesting that the first of the many individual examples given in the chapter is not about people of old, but about what we believe. It refers to the collective body of Christ. Maybe he's using this as a strategy to draw them in, to have investment in what he's talking about. More likely, he's using it because it's chronologically first. The creation of the world is chronologically first in the series that he's going to go through. Clearly, it's an important event, and it's enough to be included in the list of faith despite the fact that there's no hero in that story, a hero of faith, no, no David or Daniel, no Rahab, no, 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 uh, no Noah, no Abel, except the hero is God. And we believe in him because God creates out of nothing. It's purely the intention of his mind. He speaks and the world comes into being. So in the same way that faith is grounded in a belief, which is in our mind, that expresses itself in action, which is in the world, the world also was brought into being out of the mind of God. You see, he's pointing back to verse 1, where things unseen and things seen have their connector being faith. We believe this about the world, that God created it, not because we saw it happen, but because of what we already know about God, that he is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, the eternal first cause, and he told us, That's what he did in Genesis chapter 1. Holding fast to that belief is a practical expression of faith. It gives us reason to believe so many other things that we do about the world. God forming the universe out of nothing is foundational to the Christian worldview. It gives us reason to value every human life. It gives us reason to care for the earth. It gives us a basis for valuing marriage between one man and one woman as a reflection of God's created order. It gives us reason for valuing and honoring the family as his building block for the social order. All these things flow out of our belief in God's creative power and his activity and intention for the world. It also reminds us that there is more to the universe than we know. Or can know. There are unseen, unseen things that we cannot precisely define. There is a spiritual realm, and faith is the bridge between the seen and unthe- unseen world. Now, by extension, this means that when we're trying to explain what we find in the visible world, we should fall back on our faith in the unseen as foundational assumptions, even for their explanatory power. What do I mean by all that? 
What I'm saying is that when we run up against something that we don't understand or can't explain, God's intention for us is to default to our faith in him as the creator of the world itself rather than explaining him away with naturalistic explanations of the world without God. This is where the perceived conflict between science and faith happens. It's where it comes from. In reality, there is no conflict between science and faith. Science is simply an explanation of what we see in the world around us. But if the world we see around us is created by God, how can our examination of that world be in conflict with the fact that God exists in the first place? The problem is when scientific explanation and exploration becomes philosophical conjecture. The starting point of naturalism is a philosophical one that there is nothing more than what is seen. But history has shown us time and time again that scientific theories can be wrong, sometimes very wrong. Science has not yet been and never will be able to explain away God because it's God's universe that is trying to explain. Scientific theory about the creation of the universe are perfect examples. Prior to the theory of the Big Bang, which is the commonly accepted theory now for the beginning of the universe, Scientists mostly believed that the universe was static in size. It did not change in size, and it was just there. Now, the static theory of the universe was not from some hack scientist at the University of Nowhere. Its greatest proponent was Albert Einstein, who even built built it into his theory of relativity, which he had to revise later upon new evidence. Today, science has shown that the universe seems to be expanding and in fact appears to have come into existence at a distinct point in time. Now, the Big Bang theory is one explanation of how that happened, but that's just a theory, and it doesn't say anything about what was happening before that, which is one of the problems with using that theory to explain the origin of the universe. But what the Bible offers is more than a theory. It's the certainty that comes from faith in a God who never changes. Now, I'm a scientist, as you know, but science itself is not a reliable basis for certainty about reality because it's based on human ingenuity, and we are frail and failing. In our ability to understand things and the seen and unseen, we may be be dealing with things we have no knowledge of. So scientific theories are constantly being updated, they're constantly being disproved, but God never changes. Why is that important? Because the Bible says that faith in this God gives us understanding. Understanding about the world and the nature of reality. The Bible doesn't claim to be a scientific textbook or a replacement for scientific exploration, but it does give us a rational basis to believe in this God, in his son, Jesus Christ, who rose from the dead in the most verifiable fact of ancient history and in what he says about the world. That's why Proverbs 2, verse 6 says, the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. And Jesus said in John chapter 8, to the Jews who believed in him, Scripture says, if you abide in my word and you are truly my disciples, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Faith evidences itself in understanding. The question is, are you growing in understanding? Am I growing in understanding? Are we growing as believers in understanding? Is this evidence of faith apparent in our lives? Is the lens through which we view the world increasingly the lens of Christ? What that means is that the way we live, the way we respond to the stories and the headlines of the newspaper, or the way we interpret the tides of the political landscape, the way we understand the trends that are taking place in the cultural environment, the way we vote in the election, and the way we choose a movie at the box office, all of this is governed by a growing understanding of God and his kingdom. Is our devotional life growing richer? Or are we reading the Bible over and over again every year, never gaining any deeper insight or understanding into what it means for our lives? By by allowing the Holy Spirit to work and speak to our conscience. Our faith is expressed 
in the passionate pursuit of God as he draws us and invites us to come near to him. So instead of a prayer life that's asking God for a promotion or maybe help to, to manage my, my kids better because they're going crazy, maybe it's time to ask him for more understanding, for greater and deeper knowledge of his word, knowledge of himself, to truly open our eyes to him instruct us. We can do that as people of faith by faith. So faith evidences itself in understanding. The second point is this. Faith evidences itself in sacrifice. This is the example of Abel. Now the book of Genesis tells us the fascinating story of the first human conflict between Adam and Eve's sons in Genesis chapter 4. You don't have to turn there, but I'll just read a little bit of it for you. Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. And in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. The Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and you know the rest of the story. The first murder, Cain kills Abel, and the Lord confronts him. The Old Testament text doesn't really tell us why God accepted Abel's offering and rejected Cain. But there are several good reasons that we, we think we understand if we're growing in understanding. One is that we will see the foreshadowing of the sacrifice of Christ in the blood offering that happens through the animal. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. The other thing we know from reading further in this story when God confronts Cain is that he probably had previously prescribed for them the way in which they should make sacrifice to him. God says to Cain, why are you angry and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do what I ask, won't you be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. That recounts back to the first sin of Adam and Eve back in Genesis chapter 2. We also notice that while Cain brought some of what he had to the Lord, some of his produce... Abel brought the best of what he had. Cain brought some. Abel brought the best, the firstborn of his flock, and the fat portions specifically prescribed by God under his sacrificial system that would later be elaborated for the Israelites. The story of the Bible traced through the Old Testament and the sacrificial system, and all, all the way into the, the new covenant where the blood of Christ is spilled for us by Jesus himself, and God offers the best possible sacrifice for our sin to take it away once and for all is foreshadowed even in this early point in the story of Scripture. But what's easy to miss in all of the Jewish law in all of the ritual sacrifices that were required, is that one of the requirements is that we simply give our first and best to God. We give our first and best to him. It's not simply the tithe, but it's the first portion that God requires. The best of what you have. Why? Of course, God deserves it. He is God. He's the maker of all things. Of course, it's because it's reflecting the sacrifice of Christ. But is it possible that one of the reasons God requires the best of what we have is to increase our faith for him to provide for us? Because he wants us to trust him and not the accumulation of our own hands. Abel had an acceptable offering. He held nothing back from the Lord. He offered the most valuable of what he had to the Lord. Hebrews 11 gives us a little bit of insight in saying he did it by faith. What he was doing was evidence of his faith, and God gave him credit for that as righteousness. The question for us is, are you growing in sacrifice to the Lord? Am I growing? Are we growing together in our sacrifice for him? The billion-dollar self-help industry has a lot to say about the subject of time management. Thousands of books written out there about how to get the most out of your time, how to be more productive, how to organize your time for maximum impact. Any time management guru will tell you that one key principle of doing what's most important first is how you'll be successful. Putting the big rocks first into that jar. You've probably seen that 
illustration. Getting the most difficult stuff out of the way first. I always start our rehearsals with the most difficult piece of music because we're fresh. We have our best energy to give to it. Does that principle apply in the spiritual realm? I think it does. Am I giving to the Lord off the top of my income? Am I devoting my best energy, the time when I'm freshest and most productive to him, or am I saving that for the project at work? When we consider sacrificing in this way, it becomes more apparent why it requires trusting God. Because if I give my best away, will I have anything left? Will I have enough left? It's easy to give your money away when you've already spent the other 90%. It's easy to give 10 minutes of time to reading a verse or a, a, a devotion when you've already worn yourself out working the other 1,430 minutes of the day, even on the most noble of causes. But true sacrifice is an evidence of faith because it follows what God has prescribed. And it relies on faith in the one who prescribed it to give you immeasurably more what you have already, than what you already have and to fill you with unlimited energy to accomplish more than you could ever imagine. If we are willing to offer our whole reliance on him as living sacrifices, as Paul said to the Romans, in the totality of our being, the first and best representative of the fact that we have complete reliance on him and he owns it all anyway, then faith will evidence itself in sacrifice. Faith also evidences itself in intimacy. We gotta move a little quicker, but that's point number three. Faith evidences itself in intimacy. At the end of the story of Abel, the writer remarks that Abel still teaches us, he still speaks to us in death. By contrast, Enoch, the next character, speaks to us because he did not die. He was taken up, taken up to heaven without seeing death. The story of Enoch is in Genesis chapter 5. This is the genealogy from Adam to Noah. Let me read really quickly from you from Genesis, from Genesis chapter 5 and verse 18. Jared had lived 162 years before he fathered Enoch. Jared lived after he fathered Enoch 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Jump down to 21. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Now watch this. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah. 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. Of all the people listed in that genealogy from Adam to Noah, only two are described as having walked with God. And only Enoch has this description repeated twice. That phrase, walked with God, is unique and rich in description. It encompasses trusting, following, listening, communing, and most of all, says Hebrews, pleasing God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to approach God. Without faith, it is impossible to know God. But there is a special intimacy portrayed between God and Enoch. It's modeled by the, the saint of old for us to follow. How could Enoch get so close to the heart of God that God would take him to heaven without even passing through the shadow of death? How could Enoch be so closely aligned with the heart of God that he would be described centuries later as having walked with him? It was by faith. It was by faith. One thing I find interesting about this story is that the author teaches us Enoch's faith and the faith of one who's intimate with God not only believes God exists, but also that he rewards those who seek him. He rewards those who seek him. Faith understands that God wants to reward us. Faith does not rely on its own, its own ingenuity, our own works in order to please God and put him in our debt so that God owes us. Certainly no. We learn that every week from the Bible that by grace alone we are saved. 
It's God's grace that provides us with the faith to even believe what he has said to us and when he calls us. But faith also understands that God wants us to feel his pleasure. He wants us to feel good. That is a stark contrast to the moralistic idea or the legalistic idea that self-denial and debasement for the sake of religion is all that matters in the life of the Christian. No! God is telling us that he wants us to feel his pleasure and experience his reward both now and in the future he promises. He wants us to know when we have pleased him. How will we know that? By being intimate with God. I love worship at City Center. And one of the, the, the hallmarks of worship at, at City Center from before I came was the engagement of the people and the way the people devote their skill and their gifting to serve the Lord. Glory to God. I pray regularly for our team, for our, our servants who bless us in the morning services. I pray regularly that they will feel the pleasure of God as they serve him. That's my prayer for you too, that you will experience the pleasure of God when you offer to him the sacrifice of praise in worship. That all leads to a congregation singing, singing praises to God, not conscious of show and performance or even in their own excellence, but simply engaged together with God. So worship becomes a holy dialogue. It's communion with God. God speaks and we respond to him. We offer it back in worship. Then he responds to us with his pleasure and we respond to him with our gratitude and thanksgiving. That's the biblical model. All the while, we grow closer and more intimate with the heart of God. Are, are you growing in intimacy with the Lord? Am I growing in intimacy with him? Are we together more and more conscious of his heart and mind and will for our lives? Do you feel his pleasure with you, precious child? Faith brings you there, closer to his heart, where he wants you to be. He wants you to trust him, not just for the utility of making it from point A to point B in the spiritual walk, but to experience his pleasure with you along the way as you trust him. A heart trusting him in faith will encounter in intimacy with God. Faith evidences itself in intimacy. Very quickly and lastly, faith evidences itself in obedience. Faith evidences itself in obedience. This, of course, is the example of Noah. Verse 7 says, and I'm going to read the New Living Translation here because it captures the expression of faith in action really well. Verse 7 says, It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God, who warned him about things that had never happened before, things unseen. By his faith... Noah condemned the rest of the world, and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. That phrase, being warned, literally has the idea of being instructed. God told him what to do, and he did it, because faith is more than belief. It's acting upon the belief. Faith works itself out in obedience. What good would it have been for Noah to believe God the flood was coming, but not build the ark? That would have been a problem. But faith, true faith, always works itself out in what we do. That's why James said in James chapter 2, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith alone save him? Can that faith alone save him? He's not saying that we're saved by doing works and thus earning God's favor. He's saying that if we have faith and we don't do work, we really don't have faith to begin with. It's not works that save us, but faith is evidenced by our obedience to God and living out our actions in, in response to what he says to us. The tricky part of verse 7 for me is the idea of condemning the rest of the world. What is that all about? Well, Noah certainly doesn't have the power to condemn the world, right? Only, only God has that power. What verse 7 seems to be teaching us is that Noah's faith was a testimony for God to the world. 
That's why 2 Peter chapter 2 describes Noah as a herald of righteousness. The New Testament writers and even those, their contemporaries, liked to talk about Noah. Noah proclaimed God's truth by living out his faith. Some think that he did it by preaching, by actively preaching to a corrupt generation. This was the view of the first church father, Clement of Rome who wrote to the church in Corinth, this is not a biblical text, not an inspired text, but a text that happened around the same time as John was writing the book of the Revelation. Clement was writing to Corinth saying, Noah preached corruption, preached against a corrupt generation. And Josephus was writing around that same time too. His take on Noah was that it was his lifestyle that shamed his contemporaries, and that's how Noah condemned the world. Either way, Noah's obedience to God made him an heir of righteousness, made him a herald, a proclaimer of righteousness, according to Peter. And he was credited with that righteousness by God because of his faith. And of course, by now, you know the question that we're going to be asking, aren't we? Are we growing in obedience? Are we cooperating with the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives to grow in obedience? and be conformed more and more by the Holy Spirit to the image of Christ. We'll never be perfect on this side of glory, but the testimony of Scripture is that the living of faith is evidenced by obedience in the life of the believer. The evidence of faith is obedience. Now, all of this evidence, all of the moving of belief into action by faith, is not just a model for the disciple to emulate, though it is that. It's not just an encouragement for the believer to persevere in the face of trial, though it is that. But like Noah, our testimony by faith becomes an apologetic to the world. It becomes an evangelistic component of our day-to-day life when we follow the Lord in obedience, living out our faith. That's pretty cool. That's powerful testimony. So where does it all take us? Where does all the evidence of faith lead us? Faith is not an end in itself, of course. Faith requires an object, and the object of our faith is the great and powerful and mighty and sovereign God of the universe who has promised things we hope for. What are the things hoped for? What are the things way back in verse 1? The substance of things hoped for. What are you hoping for? What is the evidence of faith faith pointing us to? What is the testimony of our faith being lived out pointing the world to? The inheritance that Noah received. It's our hope. Our hope is of glory. It's of glory with Jesus. It's sharing in his glory, seated at the right hand of the Father. That's why Peter described it in 1 Peter 1, verse 3, like this. Listen to this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time, time yet unseen, promised by Peter through the Lord Jesus Christ himself. That's the promise of our hope. That's very good news. Because our hope is Jesus. Our hope is eternity with him. Our hope is the sharing of his glory. And that's our testimony to the world. Then, when his promises are fulfilled, then we will have full understanding and enlightenment of our minds. Then we will have no need for sacrifice because the sacrifice of Jesus has taken care of sin once and for all. But we offer ourselves as full and complete living sacrifices given over to him. Then we will have full and true intimacy with God and live in the abundance of his pleasure then it will be impossible to sin, but every act we undertake will be obedient to him and conform to his perfect will in line with his perfect pleasure. So be encouraged, dear friends, 
by the evidence of faith in the lives of these models. Be encouraged by the evidence of faith in the lives of those around you, your brothers and sisters, and be encouraged by the growing evidence of faith in your own life. We cry out with the disciples. We heard it last week. Give us faith, Lord. And he's the one who gives. He is the one who gives. Because, because by grace, you have been saved through faith. It's not your own doing. It comes from the Father. It comes from his grace, the faith to believe and to grow in him and evidence it in your life and be a testimony to the world. It's the grace of God in Christ. So you can be a light by the evidence of your faith and your daily walk with the author and finisher of your faith, Jesus Christ, because I have not seen Ear has not heard, no mind yet imagined the glory and wonder and riches of what God has prepared for those who love him and who seek him by faith. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the gift of faith in our lives. Oh, for grace to trust you more, Lord. Would you infuse the hearts of your people by the power of your spirit with the testimony of your word, and inspire us to live for you, to live out our faith to the glory of your name and the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.